back. Welcome back, everybody. We got another special Tuesday episode viewing here at 9 p.m. And, uh, you got KP here along with myself. Introduce yourself. Shawnee. The best soul food cook <laughs> around, hands down. Hands down. Without a doubt. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. I can scream and shout. Oh, no. Do it. Hey! <laughs> you got to be happy. You got to live. You got to laugh. Okay. Yes. It's a very unique setting. Uh, we're here live in her restaurant, mm -hmm. book club, social networking area. Everywhere. It's prime everything. time real estate. <laughs> <laughs> Built from the ground and up. Yes. Staten Island, New York. Yes, 381 Van Duza Street, Staten Island, New York, which is called the town, Stapleton. Yes. <laughs> and like I said, if you're ever in this area or even the boroughs, make sure you drive on out here. It's very, very well worth it. Yes. I had the best oxtail, best mac and cheese, best chicken. <laughs> Just the whole menu. Oh my goodness! <laughs> very, very touching, it, and it's 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 dab with a little special special touch of love. Yes. So, born and raised in Staten Island, what was it like as a kid growing up through here? <sighs> Taking a deep breath—that is a lot. Um, born here, but not fully raised here. I had the opportunity, if you want to call it, my parent, my father was in the service. And so we traveled here. We went to Mississippi, and then we also went into San Diego, California. And then part of my childhood was then in South Jersey, close to Philadelphia, in Burlington County, Willenboro, Mount Holly. And then I made my way back up here to Staten Island when I was 19. So kind of by force, bounced around. Mm -hmm. What is it like in the military schools? I didn't attend military schools, but for me, I guess growing up with my father in the service, I didn't know anything else. I didn't know what it was like to be anything else besides the kid that had to travel. I was used to the picking up and the moving around, but my, my parents did like a pretty good job of making me feel like I was still stable, even though we were somewhat unstable dysfunctional. yeah it was it was I mean, dysfunctional too but the 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 being uprooted didn't seem bad because it seemed like this is just what we have to do so i, I was mean, okay with it so you 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 accommodate to transition into change yes very easily and do you feel as though that accommodates to your life now change Absolutely. Like becoming adaptive, I think, is a part of my my gift of resourcefulness. So it's like when I'm able to adapt with any situation, I find myself much more uh, at ease with dealing with change because that's just a part of life. So, um, yes, I do see that even now in my current life as an adult. OK, so what was it like? In, in that type of setting to where. A kid that doesn't know what's going on with a father that's in, you know, it's kind of a high volume, high stressed area. Mm -hmm. I know that you did you accommodate a lot of stressful situations as a kid? I absolutely did. I, being the oldest of three children, I have no I had no brothers. I have no brothers. Um, plenty of brothers now as an adult. You are my brother. But Thank you. growing up as the eldest daughter to three children in my household was stressful because just of the accountability of being the oldest. So like just knowing that I'm the one that is going to be the example. My mother, my mother raised me with the title or the label of trial and error. So trial. I had to like, as an adult, I had to figure out was that a good thing or was that a bad thing for you to call me trial and error for me to like know that you were pretty much treating me like an experiment in order for you to become an adult and become a parent. I was the sort of crash course dummy you used to figure out if you were a decent enough parent to raise me. It's, so. it's interesting that you say that because we had another uh, another episode where another female mentioned that, that the, all this paves the way kind of. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. It's how yeah. everything simulates right now. Yeah. And I recall that. You know, I mean, it's just, it's just very, very interesting. Um. I was the middle child, so I mm -hmm. never really had to, but I was the male, first male of, okay. of the family. Okay. And I guess you could say I kind of had to pave the way in that way, mm -hmm. but it's different in a female setting. Yeah. It's different. Yeah. Because it's like, I'm not the person that's going to learn and not to say that I couldn't learn, but like my father didn't teach me 
or my mother. My mother and my father didn't teach me, like, it's going to be your responsibility to do this particular job because you're a female. I did every job. So, like, you know, a young man being raised in a household where he's taught if he lives amongst daughters that his job is to take out the trash and cut the grass, I took out the trash and cut the grass because I was the oldest. So, like, I learned those things. So there was no separation because of gender. It wasn't like... You took I, on the figures I had, a, a, again, adaptability. I learned to wash clothes and cook food the same way that I knew how to cut grass and paint a house. Mm. <laughs> very, very talented. Yes. Excuse me. So, uh, growing up now, let's go speed things up. You went to school? Absolutely. I went to multiple schools. Because of my upbringing, I attended schools all over the country. So, like... My childhood, I attended PS31 in New Brighton. Um, my husband, for a long time, didn't believe that we went to the same school. <laughs> same time? Same time. Um, <laughs> and then I was picked up, uprooted, and taken into California. And then I attended, you know, grammar school there. And then moving back to the East Coast, I attended middle school and high, parts of my high school in South Jersey and then came into Staten Island and finished up high school at Curtis high school. So I definitely went to school and then I exceeded what people thought I would do. And I received two master's degrees. Nice. Now bouncing from state to state, did you notice the difference in, in uh, levels of education from grade to grade, Uh, like from ninth year to ninth in California? I would say I definitely could see the difference. Uh, I attended high school, well, ninth and 10th grade in South Jersey, which was sort of like, uh, I'll say middle class community, but it also was like integrated with some upper class. So the high school that I attended in ninth and 10th grade had courtyards and, you know, campuses, big, huge, you know, huge programs. And then I ended up in Curtis High School, not to say that it wasn't upper class, but there was this much more diverse community. And I could see the difference between the way that students were educated in a more suburban community and then an urban community. And that like kind of like stuck out for me. It was also something that I was attracted to. I wanted to be in a high paced, diverse, high volume kind of community. I came from a school where there were, you know, a thousand kids in high school to going into a school where there were 2,600 kids. So to add another 1,600 kids to my community, it was a little bit more difficult trying to figure out what group or what clique I belonged to. And so that kind of like pushed me into a box where I then isolated myself because there were too many students, too much was going on. Were you, were you school driven? Like, did you like thrill you to be there and excite you or? I would say that there was an even balance of me wanting to be in school and then not wanting to be in school. I liked being in school because I was one of the smartest kids, but then part of me didn't want to be in the school because I was also one of the dumbest. Cause they say when, you know, some of the kids who are so smart are stupid. And for me, I was a class clown You know, I was very popular, but then I didn't want to be around a whole bunch of people. And I didn't also want the pressure of having to be the best. And my father didn't accept anything less. So it was like... Very competitive. Yes. If I was not getting excellent grades, if I was not in every group or every, you know, organization or club, then that wasn't pleasing to him. So it was like I had to then figure out how to meet the mark for him and then also figure out who I was and like... Growing up and being a teenager and in high school, you already have the difficulty of figuring out what is your identity. You know, that's where people most times um, experience crisis. You know, identity crisis is in high school. You don't know which club or group or clique you belong to. So, you know, I was trying to figure out where do I belong. That's when I figured out I didn't belong at all. And so I was kind of like figuring out my way in how to become like the rebel or the person who was going to be by themselves. And that's kind of like what forced me into wanting to leave the school that I was at in South Jersey and then coming into the school on Staten Island. What's your best advice for the youth to to get through that period of finding out who they are as identity and and keep going and, and continue to thrive in the education department? I would say like, if I could talk to myself now to the person that I was at 16 and 17, I would say, to myself, be yourself. I don't think that it was so important for me to figure out how to blend. I should have just figured out how to be who I was. Like, all, you know, like today culture wants to use terms like unapologetic or, 
unique or authentic. And we weren't taught those words back then. We were taught more about, you know, being a part of the group, you know, understanding who you are, blending, you know, making friends or being, you know, just keep keeping up with the Joneses. We weren't taught that your uniqueness was an identity, mm. you know, and I, and I wish that I could tell myself then that be, you're unique, be yourself and then excel in that. Don't allow the other energies around you. Absolutely. Affect yeah. It wasn't just about the old after school convers, you know, after school special conversation about peer pressure. It was about accepting or owning who I was. And I couldn't, I couldn't accept the fact that I had all these gifts and that I was really smart, but I was also edgy and I had, I had style and I had an opinion, you know, at, you know, then it was just about kind of like piping myself down in order to fit in. I should not have shrunk myself to fit in such a small box. I should have just let myself be as bold and as big as I was to the point where I make people uncomfortable wherever I was. It, it shouldn't have mattered to me. Do you regret anything? I would say for the most part, I regret boxing myself in then. Isolating yourself. Yeah, I shouldn't have done it. I should have just, you know, kind of like felt like it was okay to sharpen people by being who I was. You were going to have to like grow yourself to be around me and understand that it was a privilege to be in my presence. I didn't need to feel like I was a, it was a, it was an honor or a privilege to be around you. You needed to know who the fuck I was. So in that state of isolation and, you know, I mean, the walls are up and you don't want nobody to know who you are. What was your transition like from that phase to developing, you know, I mean, the unique sense that I don't need to put my cards up. I can understand life as it comes. Mm -hmm. I didn't really understand that until I became an adult. You know, I lived my whole life boxing myself in. I didn't become the bold Shawnee that I am today until around today. You know what I mean? I had to, like, live and die and then live again in order for me to figure out that I was somebody that's, whose presence was really powerful. Live and die and live again. You went through a phase of that kind of sort of, correct? Absolutely. It wasn't even kind of sort of. It was, yeah, it, was, and, and, and it, it happened. What, what happened? What, what was the cause of that? Uh, well, I would say that, you know, what God created for me was the opportunity for a supernatural experience, which I asked for. And so literally living in a life in, in a box where I didn't know exactly the power, the gifts and who the person was that I am today until I died. And so I had to actually embrace and accept death on September 11th, 2020 and when that day came, I was extremely prepared to lay down and die. And so dying and then being discovered by my family, you know, and being home and losing, you know, having those last breaths and then being resuscitated, brought back to life. And then in a coma, that was, you know, a conversation or an experience um, and an opportunity in itself that can't even, I can't even express it. You know what I'm saying? I can only live in it. I can live in it every day knowing that I had the opportunity to experience death in a way where I now can embrace death in a new way. I can say I'm going to live every single day of my life until I die. A lot of people don't have that capability to even pull themselves from, from, from that cliff. Mm -mm. Oh, that's, take, that's a lot to take in. Right take now. it in. Like, <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm trying like, to quick, quick. You should take that in because at, at the end of the day, everybody has a punch-in date and a punch-out date. You know what I'm saying? Everybody has that, but we also have the dash in the middle. So it's like you live your life every day understanding I was born December 12, 1976, and whatever my day is that I'm going to sunset from this realm into my new realm, what I'm really focused on is that dash in the middle of my tombstone that represents my entire life. What does that dash mean to me? Not to everybody else. Everyone else in my afterlife, people that will look at that will say, Shawnee was this person to me. So uniquely, individually, collectively, I'm going to be that person to every single body. But what is it for me to be me? What is it for me to experience that dash every day? What is my mission or my mission statement every single day? Every time you have the opportunity to every, wake up. Every single time. So now you mentioned that you asked for what came about on uh, upon this, correct? Yes. How was that like? <laughs> was it, I mean, because a lot of people could rub that genie in, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and everything else can reveal themselves before them. But not everybody's built and, you know what I mean, capable of that. Right. So actually... 
projecting that into the atmosphere mm -hmm. and then receiving that, mm -hmm. those beautiful gifts. What do you what do you recall from that? Like like what the transition from requesting it to actually experiencing it? I would say that uh, I was what I was asking for. I don't really believe I was truly prepared for. That's right. True. So like a lot of times we you know people will say to you, be careful what you ask for. You know, and that could be the minute, minuscule, material things that we ask for every day. Like, you know, I want to be a rapper. You know what I'm saying? Okay, well, you want to be a rapper. Do you know all the things that come with being a rapper? Can you handle not only being the rapper? Can you handle being the public figure? Can you handle being the person that then has to accept isolation because of your popularity? Can you handle the fact that you'll never be able to shop again in a store without people chasing you down? Can you handle the fact that people will create fan clubs and it won't even be your words, it'll be somebody else's words? Can you handle the fact that your friends or your so-called friends or the people that surround you will now expect and not even ask for you to take care of them and that you'll be out there on those you know, stages and in those interviews and, and on those endorsement contracts and you won't be doing it for yourself, you'll be doing it for them. Can you accept the fact that you've asked for that? You know what I'm saying? So when I asked for the supernatural experience, experience of being the person that I am, I wasn't really sure if I was ready to be the person that I truly am. And it was that I was going to be dependent on by so many people, not just in my community, but everywhere, all over the world. And the people were, one, going to always expect me to be positive because that's what I wanted to be. People were always going to expect me to smile. They were always going to expect me to be vibrant and alive and bright-eyed and bushy-tailed every single day. But is, there tru the, is the truth that, you know what I'm saying, on my hardest, toughest darkest day can I smile in front of somebody because that's what they depend on me to be and every day I have to be that person that's a difficult task because I'm not asking necessarily to then be myself I'm asking to be something for somebody else that's a that that's a job in itself is to get up and get dressed every day and to bump into somebody outside that may be going through one of the most difficult times of their lives and what the only thing that's going to require them or get them out of their really shitty day is me stepping up to them and saying, how are you today? I love you. Are you having a good day? You could change somebody's whole life. The whole day. I, you know, like, I sometimes get upset with myself when I'm not, fully, you know. Fully vibrant. When I'm not, yeah, when I'm not my whole self because then it's like, you think of situations like where somebody commits, commits suicide or attempts suicide. It's like, damn, I could have possibly changed the trajectory of their lives by just smiling. And I got to tell people that every day. It's like, you go outside, you never know what kind of day that person is having. You, when you bump into that person and you see them, you got to embrace them with love because you have no idea what they're going, with, going through today. And you may be the medicine or the purpose or the person in front of them that actually saves their lives. And they won't even tell you. A lot of people that have those down days will stare you right in the face and smile and say they're having a good day and go home and attempt to kill themselves or hurt somebody else. And you have no idea if you are the person that had the power or the words or the encouragement or the motivation to get them out of their trouble. Make them or break them. Make them or break them every day. Like I said, I know you shared some things with me and I really appreciate that. You know, life's... The way life presents itself sometimes is just very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't question it. Just accept it for what it was. And live in it. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, whether, you know, I mean, whatever decision you do, you have to live in it. Be present. Like, that's my biggest thing when I'm speaking to people is like, I want people to always speak in presence. Speak with presence. Speak in the present. Speak in today, right now, where I'm at right now. You said... You know, oh, we'll put off the interview till next week. How do I know I'll be here next week? No, I'm doing the interview today. I'm here. You asked the, asked the team. You Absolutely. Know, and, and, I, and as soon as I said that, I said, no, we got that's She knows. She, that's just she it. knows. You can't. You can't. <laughs> and like, believe me, oh, no, I know. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, we I, don't create. We don't create, nor do we control time. No. So why are we trying to operate in it as if we get to push the buttons to say, I got time to do that? No, I'm present. The way I take it is messages are more important than moments right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and I had to, I had to I had to hear that message rather than a moment that I was gonna live in. Right. 
sometimes you just gotta go. Just go with it. So, like I says, it's, 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 I mean, bro, it's interesting, <laughs> man. <laughs> oh, so, I don't know. It's just you have you have a unique setting here in this restaurant. It's a very very relaxed, very very uh, welcoming, mm-hmm. and you use a lot of natural herbs and stuff in your in your in your work. Yeah. Could you elaborate a little bit of why and, and the medicines that you use? Well, I'll say why the restaurant is the way that it is is because of the life lesson I received in death. So when I was sent back by the spirit and they said, hey, open up a restaurant, the reason why I opened up the restaurant to be this way is because the spirit said, what did you feel on the other side? And what I felt was an incredibly secure and amazing infinite hug. That's what death was for me. Death was a hug. Death was an embrace that was so secure to say, there's really nothing wrong with being over here on this side. This is actually the better side to be on. And when I was creating the vibe in the restaurant, because everybody says it's a vibe, it was, I was creating the energy that I needed people to receive when they walk in here. I needed every single person, whether I'm here or not, because there's going to be a time where I'm not here whether it be in life or in death. But the legacy that I'm creating is the infinite hug. I'm creating the hug that when people walk in here, they're going to feel like they've been embraced by love, unconditional love every single time. I know that when I came in here, it's just like I shut my shoulders, just... <laughs> right, calm down, Absolutely. just relax. Absolutely. Enjoy where you're at and be present. Be present in here. I didn't want any kind of like airs or phoniness or stuffiness to be in here. I wanted you to feel like whether you had sweatpants on or a suit, you felt elevated, you felt loved, you felt embraced, you felt like this was something that was worthy of spending your money and your time in. And so I wanted everybody to feel exactly the same. I wanted everybody to feel like they belong. You all belong here. Yes, we do. (laughs) And so naturally, when you're creating food, which is medicine, and it's also food has two powers. It's either going to kill you or it's going to heal you. So every day you can eat in a place and kill yourself because you're not eating the things that you need in order for you to be better. You're not eating the things that are going to give you optimal health. They're not going to feel excellent. They're not going to speak to you or talk to your soul. But then the food that I choose to prepare is the food that is going to heal you and help you. So one of the responsibilities that I have in preparing food is making sure that I infuse One, love. Two, anything that is natural that is going to make things better. What I didn't want was I didn't want soul food to be attached to its old label of having, you know, and I'm no knock to my ancestors. My ancestors figured out how to give scraps flavor and make it taste really, really good. So what my ancestors did was they transformed, you know, fat back and hog bog and you know, chitlins, all these things, all of these ingredients they selected, they put these things into the food and they made the food really good to their souls when they were really in troubling times. They were slaves, they were enslaved, they were, you know, poverty stricken, they weren't in the best situations, but they made this food taste so good that it allowed them to escape those really difficult times. What God showed me was that I can transform soul food and make it healthy and still make it extremely enjoyable. And so a lot of the ingredients that I infuse in the food were created right from the earth, but then they were put right into that food. So like oxtail being infused or cooked with black walnut hull or, you know, putting crushed soursop leaves, adding sea moss for gravy. Like these are things that I'm putting in there, not because... Um, I want it to just taste good. I want it to also feel good to your body. I don't want you to eat soul food and get itis. I don't know what itis is. I want soul food to give you energy. I want you to get up out of your seat and I want you to go outside and I want you to go attack every single dream and vision that you have out there. And I want the food to contribute to that. I want you to have life when you come in here and I want you to have new life when you walk out of here. So the responsibility of the restaurant is that people walk will walk in here one way and they'll leave out of here another. 
And so far, I've left out here in positive every, every <laughs> time. Every time. Right. I mean, sometimes life presents itself in a negative way to me. You know, it's happened so fast. And mm -hmm. It's just so much confusion and chaoticness. But definitely leaving these doors here, you definitely create the atmosphere. Absolutely. Definitely create the atmosphere. Um, you guys, you have a lot of different things here. You have uh, book clubs in different settings and celebrities. And <laughs> let's let's dive into a little bit. Can you name some of the celebrities that you had here? Well, I have the what? whole crew here right now who is all, you are all celebrities to me. Every single individual that I encounter is a star. Mm. And I really, really appreciate that. Absolutely. We all have star power. We all have the ability to mm. connect. We all have the ability to encounter. We all have the ability to uplift. And so we all got to walk in our ce celebrity status. You know what I'm saying? There's levels to this shit. Mm. So, like, we have to understand that we all are walking around. Exactly. Clap for yourselves. Applause for yourselves. You know what I'm saying? That's the light that I created for myself. But it's also the light that I create when I encounter people. When I shake somebody's hand and I walk up to Boom and I walk up to Angry Elephants and Heck and everybody else in the world, K Woods and, you know, Tracy Brown and Chase and, you know, Tyrone Briggs and everybody on Staten Island is doing something really fabulous and dope. I'm shaking the hands of a superstar. You know what I'm saying? And I'm surrounded by these superstars every single day because they're out here being authentic. They're being themselves. But I also had the opportunity on other levels to experience people like Danny Glover, Ed Norton, Bruce Willis, uh, uh, Cardi B, A Boogie, Lou Pepper Williams, uh, Charlemagne the God, Teddy Riley, Jagged Eds, Next, Naughty by Nature, Selena, uh, t Tobias Trevelyan, like I'm meeting all of these celebrities and they have no idea that they're meeting a celebrity who is me. I am Shawnee. I make sure that I say that to them because I need them to remember who I am. And I believe that it's important to let celebrities know when I stepped up on the scene, niggas was petrified. <laughs> yeah, like you need, <laughs> yes, you need to know that I walked up on this thing and you should be petrified about who you just walked up on because I'm a celebrity in my own light. I am my own energy. I am my own superstar. I am my own greatness. I am the goat of what I do. Mm. And I respect the fact that we're both standing in the same exact room because the access that I have is the same access that you have, but I know how to use mine and I use mine humbly and gratefully. You may not be as grateful as I am, and that's why every room I get in, I earned it. I didn't deserve it. And so when I walk with that kind of understanding, it's not an entitlement. It is just what it is. And it's encouragement for somebody that may not know who they really are. Authentic. Mm-hmm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> now you got a lot of interesting things. <laughs> <laughs> And the restaurant, like you said, it does represent a lot of different things. Like one of the things that I felt was extremely important, especially for the Staten Island community, is we went a very long time on Staten Island not understanding that we were visible whether you were going to acknowledge us or not. And so what I did was I created visibility for every single person that wanted to then show themselves. And so each and every person that walks in this room, if you have a business, if you have an organization, if you have a passion, what I did was I gave those businesses, those organizations, those entrepreneurs, those healthy, wonderful, passionate uh, creatives, I gave them a platform. So they bring their products in here. I don't ask them for any money. I don't want a contract. But I do say bring your product in here and sell it. And I'm not going to sell it for you. I want you to sell it yourself. So when you present a product on our closet, on our shelf, on our or in our on our uh, counters, the you have to make sure that your product has the excellence, the uh, the um, the integrity, and it has the ability to stand out on its own. Mm -hmm. And so when angry elephants, when vicious minds, when um, affinity, when infinity, uh, when so statin, when uh, or the original street doctor when um, who else do we have cannabis mom when we have Trevelyan true sea moss when we have these products sitting on these uh, shelves in here these things are standing out on their own it doesn't have anything to do with me 
It's because they desire to want to elevate. They want it to be seen. And so put your shit on the counter. And let it speak for itself itself because at the end of the day, dope sells itself. My food speaks for itself. I don't have to force anybody to eat it. You're going to eat it and then you're going to love it. (laughs) The same way that these products are going to be out here and you're going to love them whether you like it or not because they wouldn't be up here if they didn't didn't earn it, not deserve it. They earn their spot on those shelves. Mm. And so this is a hub for creative people who desire to be excellent and also desire to be successful. And so it's not only just a safe space for people to come in and eat. It's also a safe space for people to come in and network and connect. And so they come into these, into the living room, they sit down and they get to know each other. They sit down at the tables and they eat and they, and the customer sitting at table one can speak to the customer sitting at table four and speak to the customer sitting at table five, because we're not customers. We're family. Mm. It's the hug. It's that's the hug. It's sit down and eat and enjoy each other's company regardless of who's in the room because you're in the room because you deserve or you've earned to be in here. And that's just what it is. It's, it's, it's the house. It's a family. We're a situation. You know, Staten Island is not the forgotten borough. Staten Island is the borough. It's the borough that's making, moving, and shaking the entire earth because we're doing shit that nobody else is doing. Mm. We're doing things where, yeah, you may think that we're isolated. No, we're choosing to be unique and stand out on our own on this rock. This rock is 13.5 miles long, and you know what? We all know what we're doing. We all know who we are. We all know each other, and then we big you up whether we want to or not. Mm. When I wear a drippy T-shirt, when I'm walking around wearing something from k West Foundation, when I, when I support a flyer that Uncle Chase has out here for a concert, I'm not doing that because I want to. It's because I have to, because that's my brother, that's my sister. That's family. We're out here being family, whether we like it or not. You don't always like your mom and your dad and your cousins and your brothers and your uncles and your aunties. You don't like everything that everybody's doing in your family. That's the dysfunctional part of being human. But at the end of the day, you know what humans also do? Families do. They got your back. Whether you're dead wrong or not, your cousin going to stand behind you knowing damn well you wasn't supposed to take that out of that store. But you know what you're not going to do? You're not going to put your hands on them without me doing something about it. Absolutely. And so you're not going to do anything to anybody's brand on Staten Island or anybody's business on Staten Island without making sure that you go through me. That's it. It's, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a strong point because since I've been here, I, I see that everywhere, you know what I mean? Not just here, not just, you know what I mean, K-Woods and all mm-hmm. that. It's just unique. Everyone big everybody up. That's it's, it. It's, it's just, it's a unique thing. It's just, if the world could work like that, I mean, it'd be a different place. Oh, it is going to work like that. We are going to impact people in a way where you're going to realize. And I was just talking to my husband about this. I said, you know, the funny thing is people talk about Staten Island like Staten Island doesn't exist. But, you know, I'm here. You know, what I'm saying like for Drippy to make to, to then partner. And, and the reason why I had the conversation was because my husband's brother, Anthony, who is in um, Arizona, connected with Heck. And they opened up Drippy Cuts Designs out there. And now that's a collaboration that's happening in Arizona. So like whether you like it or no, whether you like it or not, Staten Island is in Arizona. Mm. That's a global movement. Absolutely. Because somebody's going to go in there and go get a haircut or go get a facial or go get some type of service. And then they're going to buy a very unique T-shirt. And then they're going to ask, why do you have that on your on your door or on your T-shirt? And the only answer that Anthony can give is because I'm in a collaboration with my brother who also makes sure that he touches on the cause of making sure that elephants are safe and not extinct. That's Global, because we ain't got no elephants on Staten Island besides the angry elephant. Mm. So that means you are attacking a concern in Africa, which means we're everywhere. It's Staten Island against everybody. And so we're doing something that is so powerful and so creative with such a small group of people. So no, we ain't Brooklyn, nah, we ain't. We're not Queens, we're not Manhattan. But what Staten Island is doing is they're showing you that, yes, people do work in numbers, but even our small numbers work because we're one. And we're one, W-O-N. We already got the victory, Mm. right? That's deep. 
I tell people all the time, I'd rather have four quarters than 100 pennies. I know that's right. And the spirit just told me, stop grappling for pennies because pennies get heavy when you put too many in a bag. Reach for light because light is lighter and it also feels better for you. Mm. <laughs> Why are you, you, you leaving me speechless here? With the, oh. <laughs> that was my lesson yesterday. <laughs> As I'm walking out of here, I'm just like, oh, do I really got to come back? No. <laughs> no, no, push it off. No. <laughs> we ain't pushing shit off. No. Like I said, it, it's a beautiful thing. And like I told him before, we can't run for that. We have to, you know, I have a gift to aunt, and there's things in my life that was elaborated on that came mm -hmm. true that I challenged. And, you know, like I said, I, those trials and tribulations, you know, would happen for whatever reason they happen. And we are here presently. Right. You know, we, we are trying to uplift everybody and shed that light. <laughs> Absolutely. You guys are really shedding a lot of light because I love the intro that you guys had. And you did talk about the trials and tribulations. And, like, sometimes people get in fear of even having the conversations about trials and tribulations. And y'all started the conversation off by making people uncomfortable. Please let me, I'm letting you know that you are going to sit down in this podcast right now. We're going to have a conversation and the questions that I ask you may be a little bit uncomfortable because we're talking about trial and tribulation, but I'm bringing light to the situation. Okay. That's what I get from you guys. And I get from your, you know, what you guys are making of something that is going to be extremely powerful in the podcast world, because that's a whole world in itself. But you guys are showing up and showing out in a way where it is really going to ignite people to really be um, unafraid of the struggle or the trial or the obstacle because you're standing in union as one. You know, like people don't really know how to accept the fact that sometimes we do have to fight. We got to fight through a lot of difficult, troubling times. But you guys, are so, there's no weak link here. There's no weak link here. Thank you. Yeah, I love it. I love that. I mean, these guys are really giving me the push. You know, like I said, sometimes I get up with not even knowing what I got to do, but we all sink each other. Right. Yo, this is what we got to do. You know, or, that's right. And it's a beautiful thing because that's my that's the ultimate goal of this, and then to, to shed that light. I know the Africans, the natives, the, you know what I mean? There's a lot of us that went through struggles, trauma, traumatistic things in our life that affect us mm -hmm. and a lot of us are hindered from that and, and won't reach out on that fear and right. and won't reach that fruit at the end of the tree right because they're so scared and they don't have a safe space to have the conversation mm. but if you guys are creating the safe space to have those troubling conversations then it's going to be a lot easier for them to reach out and say yes this is what i'm going through and i don't really know how to manage or get through and as long as you guys, you know, continue to um, be transparent and be authentic, people are going to want to have those kind of conversations with you all the time where they're going to say, you know what, I'd rather go on your podcast. I'd rather be on this podcast than be on a different podcast because I don't want them to air out my dirty laundry to make me feel like I'm a terrible person. I would rather them tell me that they're going to stand with me or band with me in support of my situation and then force me to get into a better situation. Because what's going to happen is you guys are going to um, come into situations where you are going to have more access than any other group. And then what you're going to do is open up that access to other people in order for them to find help. And so I want you guys to really like tap into that, tap into your access and then use it, use it. Mm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What would you say your biggest hurdle in life has been? This damn restaurant. And why? <laughs> because, you know, like, opening up a restaurant is not the easiest thing for, I think, any business owner to do. Like, the one thing that I believe all restaurant owners or chefs or cooks go through is trying to people please. You know, you're going to have people walk in that door and you're going to be so fearful that somebody's not going to like what you put on a plate. Or they're not going to like the service, you know, because restaurants are about not just the food. It's about hospitality in itself and serving servitude. And I've gone into several thousands of restaurants in my life and have put money on the table knowing damn well they didn't deserve my money. You know, and it necessarily it might not have been because of the food that was served. It might have been because of the service. It might be because the waitress or the waiter sucked or the manager wasn't even present or, you know, like just something wasn't clicking. The food might have been dynamic, fat, fantastic, but 
the person who handed it to me handed me with horrible energy. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So when I came into this restaurant game, it was like I opened up my my restaurant knowing only what it was to be a cook in my house. And so re- the restaurant game was totally different because now I'm up against the entire world. I took on the responsibility of becoming a brick and mortar. I was no longer this hidden gem in my house selling food, you know, selling these hood plates like mixtapes is what I used to call them, you know, styrofoam plates and pushing them out the door. But, you know, what I did was unique in my house because I had reservations in my house. I had people dining in in my living room, in my kitchen room, in my backyard. I had people, you know, picking up. I had delivery going tri-state, you know what I'm saying? People were crossing over the bridge to come into my house and eat. Mm -hmm. And that was a totally different thing because I wasn't under the arm of the IRS. I wasn't under the scrutiny of the community uh, in a way where it was like all about the public because I could say what customer could come in my house. I can't say what customer can come in here. People can walk past or walk in every single day and I can't push them out. I can't say, no, you can't be here. But the, the unique thing about this restaurant is what I do every day is I oil my door in order to keep the people out that don't belong in here. Mm. And so people think that You know, oh, you're doing that. And, you know, oh, my God, you could be scaring people off. I'm scaring off the spirit that don't belong in here that's not supposed to eat. Mm -hmm. Not supposed to eat this. And anybody that walks in here was supposed to be in here just like church. Everybody ain't going to get the message if they weren't at church, right? So you may not belong to this particular sermon, but you're going to get another sermon another day, and it ain't going to be today. But oiling my door every single day is what I do in order to make sure that the right people walk in here. Because it's not really about the money. It's about the, it's about the responsibility of serving the right people on the right day at the right time. And so I got to make sure that that door is oiled to make sure that the right people walk in at the right time and they're fed and they're sent out into the world to go do what they have to do. And so coming into this restaurant, knowing that I was up against inventory and I was going to be up against you know, rising inflation and prices going up and having to speak and educate my community and my people on, you know, the adjustment of budget, you know, teaching them that, no, today you can't have snapper, but you can have a two fish combo because that's what you can afford. There's something on there for every single person. But what that's teaching me is how to have the uncomfortable conversation with my community about the way that they're spending and consuming their dollars or using their dollars. Yes, I want my dollars to circulate in this community a hundred times the same way that they discuss it circulating in a Jewish community. But we don't want to do that at the cost of putting our people in poverty because they want to stand up or keep up with the Joneses. I don't need you to come in here and eat if you can't afford it. Because at the end of the day, what you are buying is well worth the dollars. 100%. If not more, I should charge you more for me being here because my presence is worth that too. Mm. But they don't understand that. So you'll give it to Wolfgang Puck, you'll give it to Guy Fieri, you'll give it to Emeril Lagasse, but I am Shawnee. And when you walk in here, you're paying for my time because my time I don't control. And the day that I can't prepare a meal, I've given it up for $12. No, we're not doing that. I'm giving it up to make sure that I change your life. So when you walk in this restaurant and you spend your money, you know that you're investing in your life, not mine. I'm sorry. I just mean this. I don't mean to cut you <laughs> off. But mom, I hope you're watching. Because <laughs> my mother, she's a cook. And she always, she always cuts herself short. She should not. And I tell her, you got the most. You put all that love into that. And you know, I mean, there's time to where she's just like she she wants a people please. I smile. You can't do that. Yeah, we're not doing that. People no. pleasing, uh, people pleasing support groups are meeting over there on another day <laughs> down the road. But we're not doing that over here. It's funny because no. every time I even tell the boys to go there, you give her more. You, she just oh no no no, it's fine. It's not right. Like, no no no, mom. Mm-hmm. It's not. You know what I mean? Right. We won't go to the next door and you're not good. And, food. and not yeah, exactly. And so what you should probably do in your mom's house or wherever it is that she's preparing her food, put a little collection plate, a donation cup over there you know what i'm saying because you don't you don't walked into church and so if i give you the price and this is the price for the food i'm gonna need you to leave a donation because my ministry is that i'm helping heal you Mm. and then force people to give they say in the muslim and jewish community in their you know in their culture it's a privilege to give or a privilege to donate and so you got to give people the privilege to donate to a ministry 
and by putting in front of putting in front of people that that's a donation plate is going towards her ministry and wanting to get up every day and feed you. And so people shouldn't be uncomfortable with giving. Mm. You know what I mean? Giving is a gift. Absolutely. That's a gift. Te- teach your people to give. There's a lot of people that would just take and take and take and take. Right. They don't give a rat. And they don't understand that, you know, you could be blessed behind you giving. Uh, many times I will turn around and go pay for somebody's groceries or buy something for somebody. And what I can say is, no, I can't even count my blessings. I can't because today I'm breathing them up. I put my clothes on today. I ate. I fed my kids. I'm I'm here in the restaurant. I'm around powerful, wonderful people. Can I count all these blessings? Absolutely not. Because every time that you inhale and exhale, exhale in my space and around me, it is a blessing to me because I've encountered you. And that that's something I can't pay for. So you might as well pay for something because we all going to leave up out of here with debt. <laughs> you can't take no U-Haul with you, nor can you take a Brink truck at all. So you might as well give it away. Absolutely. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you there. Um, so I got to ask you a question. Back to your cooking. Mm-hmm. Do you pray when you cook? I absolutely pray while I'm cooking. I pray the entire time that I'm cooking, not only because I want people to receive my love and my blessing, but I also get sick and damn tired of burning myself. I get tired of dropping food in the kitchen. I get tired of bumping my husband. I get tired of all the things that are very difficult going on back there. So we got to always be praying in there. And I believe that the prayer that is going into that food is truly received with every single person that partakes in that food. When they're eating it, you know, we we started out at Say Grace. I'll say this. We started out with the business Say Grace. Say Grace was is our catering business. It is the umbrella to everything that it is that I'm doing. We went back and forth with Say Grace because in the beginning when I wanted to name my business, I wanted to name it Grace 5 because God had given me the grace to birth five children when I was told that I could not have any kids. Mm. And when I was going back and forth about the name with my sister on the phone, say grace comes up and she's like, yeah, I think it should be say grace. And the spirit said, finally, you're not making it about you. And I said, what does that mean? And it said every single time that somebody contacts say grace catering, they have then given me the opportunity to bless them because they prayed just in saying the word say grace. You are praying. You are praying. Hello, is this say grace on the phone? Yes, this is. How are you, Shawnee? I am blessed. That's a whole prayer in itself. And so by you just receiving that, you are receiving the gift of prayer and of blessing. And so that business grew phenomenally because I didn't make it about me. I remember when people used to call me and they used to try to order catering and they say, hi, is this grace on the phone? I'm like, no, who's grace? They were like, well, isn't this say grace? I'm like, yeah, you're praying, aren't you? And they're like, what? Mm. I'm like, yeah, my name is not Grace. It's not about me. It's about you calling out to God and saying thank you for finding the right person to prepare your food. Mm. So it wasn't about me, but they thought that I was saying say grace, being so egotistical and disgusting and making it about myself when it didn't have anything to do with that. It was about making sure that people acknowledged God in everything that they do in order for them to then have their paths directed. And that came through in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It was like, acknowledge him in all your ways and he'll direct your path. You know what I'm saying? So it was about making sure that I made forced people. So what? We may not all, you know, may not all, may not all believe Christianity or, you know, Muslim or, you know, read the Torah or whatever it is. But at the end of the day, there's a source that gave you life. Acknowledge it. And then let it bless you, however you choose to be blessed. And so that's what Say Grace was created for, was for you to acknowledge the gift or the power that gave you breath of life. And then gave you the opportunity to afford me as your caterer. (laughs) So you and your husband invested, you guys have lasted into this business, correct? Uh Huh? You guys invested like pretty much all your money. Oh yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. My husband is actually my financier. Thank you to Jason, um, the Jason Dixon Foundation that um, uh, invested and founded my business because he handed me his six hundred and thirty six dollar check at the time and told me to leave my job. And he said, go out and go buy some food and then start cooking and then sell it. And I was looking at him like, what are you talking about? 
And he said, yeah, take my check and go go and start your business. And I said, uh, I don't know what I'm, how, how am I supposed to do that? He said, just go to the store and buy the food. And I went into supermarkets and spent, you know, money at a high market rate buying food out of a supermarket. And I put one blast on Facebook and he stole the print and the paper and the and the ink from his job and printed several flyers. And we went around handing them out. And that's how we started the business. And that one blast with that one menu on Facebook doubled his money. So like like hood plates, like mixtapes, like crack on the block, I sold chicken. And I turned that thing into a business off of his paycheck that one week. Did you ever see that? I mean, you probably had the passion to cook all the time. I had a passion to cook, and we did do it before then, but I wasn't serious about choosing my passion over my pension. And so mm. I didn't give up on my job, which at the time my job was my financier to my business because I was pretty much just stealing time from my employer. I apologize to you, New York City Department of Education, for stealing all of their time and all of that Wi-Fi data that I was doing in order to look for my new life and my new business and not giving you 100 percent of me when I was there, because now as an employer and as somebody who is looking to give passionate creators of the hospitality and culinary industry. I desire for me to attract those passionate people that do not desire to steal time, nor my inventory, nor my business, you know, or my investments to come in here and help build a mission and a vision to grow Shawnee's house globally. And so I am encouraged to apologize to every employer that I ever did wrong because I don't want them to believe that I took advantage of them, which I did. But I don't want anybody to come and do that to me. I respect that. It, it's crazy the, the, the way that we acquire certain things and where it gets us after. Mm -hmm. You know, mine was in a dark space. You know, I had to reconfigure myself and through my own actions. But I can't, I can't get mad at that. You know, I can't, I can't get mad at myself for taking time away from my family, not being there when I should have been, right. you know, to get to where I'm at right now. Right. You know, so, but... As long as I, I learned, as long as we we mean what we say, you know, what I mean, we can't. Other than that, wherever wherever it lays after that, it lays. Yeah, like we're gonna let the chips fall where they may, but at the end of the day, we're gonna put these chips together like puzzle, and we're gonna have a really fabulous, beautiful picture at the end. You know what I'm Can saying? Can we both put the, the the last piece in together? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. We no can. as a team. Everybody. As a team, we all gonna put that last piece in the puzzle. Yep. And we are going to create legacy for this generation. And when people look back at this generation in time and they see these powerful people that emerged in a very dark place where the world was, which is called the pandemic, all of these powerful entrepreneur, millionaire, jet setting, you know, enterprise, empired people came out of the rubble and created something that was going to pave the way for young people to come out and not be in fear of the things that are ahead of them because there's something else coming. You know what I'm saying? But we're past that. Mm -hmm. We actually survived beyond that catastrophic, horrible, you know, time in our lives where the same way that our ancestors did it during the time of the Great Depression, you know, civil wars, all these things. They got through those things and they at that time thought that they wouldn't. But then the Rockefellers and the Carnegie's and all those people came out from the Getty and everybody else came out of those situations. And we're getting ready to be the Gettys, the Microsofts, the Steve Jobs, you know, these the, 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 the Dr. Phil's the big people that came out of those old generations we're getting ready to be the new generation of that and we are going to be the blueprint of what people look into when they want to figure out how to get out of a really excuse my language for a lack of a better fucking term a fucked up time we're going to create a new time a new stamp a new architecture, a new design for coming out of a troubling situation. Uh, the present day that we live in now, the, this kid, these, ch excuse me, these troubled childs that were get, that were birthed by these adolescents mm -mm. need guidance. That the right now, correct? Right, absolutely. I mean, just the entire generation, like these young people. You know, you don't want to. Uh, knock them for the things that they're going through. I felt really, really bad for my daughter who graduated in 2020, who never experienced a graduation or prom. You know, that's something that you're taking something from them that they didn't get to experience and they didn't have a choice. 
what I'm saying? Nobody explained to them what the pandemic was or how it impacted them. So we don't know what the outcome is going to be for them and how they then internalize that and then how they extract that energy and get it out, right? Mm. So, like, just because the world or, you know, our society created this uh, this system of education where, you know, you go to school all these years, you put in, you know, K through 12 to get to that big day of graduation and prom and school trip. And then you snatch that from them on a government imposed illness that then destroys the entire globe. You know, how do you get that whole generation of young people to understand that they now have to then integrate themselves back into so-called normal life? You know what I'm saying? You're not going to be able to do that. And so we have to then empower them to see, yes, you guys went through a very difficult time. There's no way to explain what you guys went through. But what we can do is we can provide the resources and the experience and the understanding and then the support and the counsel and the mentorship to you so that you get through that difficult time to understand sometimes it ain't always about being normal and doing normal, regular things that every other generation went through in order for them to get to success. Because you know what? Everybody don't need college Mm -hmm. to be a millionaire. Everybody didn't need need you know a master's degree everybody didn't need to even graduate high school to be powerful people out here in the world so yes you did invest by force because of your parents to go to school all those years but that experience is not going this experience that you went through right here is not going to take away your destiny And if you trust what I'm doing or you trust my support or you trust my guidance or you trust my nurturing or you just trust my steps in what I'm doing in order for me to go and grow and glow, then you're going to follow behind in this blueprint and you're going to be more successful than I was because you're going to trust that your natural innate ability to succeed is going to happen because you're going to adapt like we spoke about in the beginning of the conversation we're going to adapt to what's being provided to us right now we're going to utilize those resources to the best of our ability in order for for us to be at a hundred we want to be a hundred percent of ourselves and so in order for us to do that we got to process the fact that we now have to adapt Mm. this is our new life Our new life is that some of us got the COVID shot and some of us don't. Some of us got PPP loans and some of us didn't. Some of us got supportive clicks and some of us don't. But at the end of the day, that don't mean that we can't be successful, powerful entrepreneurs who really fuck shit up. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that it stops us. We are unstoppable like water. Adapt. Mm -hmm. Take up the space and do whatever it is that you have to do because a drop of water can break an entire brick if it keeps doing it persistently. I love that because a lot of people fail to realize. And I don't like to compare energies. And I ask people, what's more powerful, fire or water? And I always tell people it's water because water will eventually move things constantly. If right. Once, it, once it's repetitive, Absolutely. water will move it. Water can't be stopped, but you can blow fire out. Absolutely. You can't do nothing with the water. The water comes from everywhere. Water is in you. Water's in your fruit. Water's in your food. Water's everywhere. It's surrounding us. It can drown us or it can allow us to float if we know how to swim. So when we adapt like water and we take up space, the same way you put it in this cup, I took shape. The same way that the water will flow and do whatever it has to do in order to take over the entire space. Mm. And so we got to teach our babies to adapt just like water. Flow, go with the flow, be the water. Cause at the end of the day, fire and water work together and that makes shit real hot, don't it? Absolutely. (laughs) Before we get to the end of this episode, I'd like to ask you a question for the beginners that are just now learning their gifts or the ones that are just now experiencing, you know, I mean, this, this enlightening, Mm -hmm. what would your best suggestion for those that are just now in, tu- in tuning themselves with themselves, which sense would you say to touch on first out of the six senses that we each individual has? Where would you target to start first to keep them on a positive track? I would say tap into this to your to your sense of vision. One, see things clear, and then I would also say in terms of your spiritual senses, tap into your intuitiveness. Because everybody has the ability to see, feel, and receive things beyond what the naked eye can see. And that is your power of discernment. 
you know when you're in a bad situation and you know when you're in a really good situation. And that comes from your intuitive ability to tap in. And so what I would say is use your eyes to see things so clear beyond what people are presenting you to you in the flesh. See through them like saran wrap. So basically see with your eyes when you're feeling, see with your eyes when you're listening. Absolutely. See with your, mm. Absolutely. Tap into that because you can see way. I can see clearly through people all day long. They think they're hiding something from me. You're absolutely not. My superpower is like Superman. I see right through you. Mm. And I use that it. That asks for that. Absolutely. Oh <laughs> That's right. A little simulation. That's right. I use that every single day because at the end of the day, I didn't know that I could tap into my intuition in order for me to see past. And now that I tap into intuition, I know that grace covers me. I'm never in a dangerous situation because I know how to get out of those situations. If I am in a situation that doesn't look as conducive as it needs to be, I know when to go and when to come. And listen, people, if that's ever a point in your life right now, don't ever be scared to turn around and, and, and Absolutely. deal with the wrath of whatever they talk about. Because like I said, that decision could make or break you. It could end your life or it could, you know what I mean, permanently leave you in a dark place. Absolutely. So like I said, when it comes to those type of decisions, people, make sure you keep, you know what I mean, don't be scared to turn around. Absolutely. That's a powerful statement. Um, where can people reach you at? Y'all can absolutely reach me at my whole brick and mortar, 381 Van Duzer Street, Staten Island, New York. 10304 is the town. We are in Stapleton. And we are offering something extremely powerful on Staten Island. Me as an eighth generation to the first free black man to purchase property on Staten Island, which was also a part of the Underground Railroad. Look for me in Sandy Ground as well. That is on Staten Island. Harriet Tubman done stopped here and knew how dope we was in Sandy Ground. And so can you. You can find me on Instagram at Shawnee's House, S-H-A-W-N-A-E-S house you can also find me at uh this is shawnee on instagram shawnee's house has a facebook page i also have a website coming up it is currently under construction at shawnee's house.com but you can also go to saygraceny.com and find me there and send me uh an email and i don't hold anything back with you guys dialing my phone number 845-595-8511 uh, you can leave a message there. And I, I think I'm kind of a big deal right now because you can also Google me. I think you forgot one more thing. Yes. The foundation. The Lotus Bridge is our um, nonprofit organization. That is an organization ran by Jason Dixon Sr. We are currently working on our, somebody wants attention. We are working on our community farm. That's okay. We are working on our community farm in the now born area of Staten Island, New Brighton. We're getting ready to teach our people how to grow and glow. And that is by farming, urban farming. And mm. so put your hands in the dirt and grow some things out here that are going to give you life. And that is going to go through the Lotus Bridge, Inc. Um, it does have an Instagram page. We are working currently to help build as expeditiously as we can to get our website up. But we work very closely with our leadership here on Staten Island and beyond Staten Island with our uh, council person and our assemblyman and our state senate. Um, and so that's something that we definitely want you guys to stay tuned for. But what I would say just right now is come and invest in the business. Make a reservation. We only got six tables. We're open Thursday, Friday, and Saturday from 5 to 11. Um, and we do that because we make sure that we invest the rest of the week in ourselves and taking care of ourselves and our community. Mm. And so if you want to come in here and, and dine in and have a most pleasurable and excellent uh, experience with us, then I would say you need to make that reservation. Call us 845-595-8511 or do it in our DM at Shawnee's house on Instagram or just stop in here and visit. If you can, we will try to take you and do a walk in if possible. And if we don't got a table for you, then have a seat in the living room. Like I said, people, it's well worth the wait no matter what. <laughs> The oxtail, everything I've I have touched these taste buds has been so <laughs> magnificent and life changing. <laughs> I mean life changing because the energy that you taste and it goes into your body. Like I said, people, I'd like to thank everybody for tapping in with the special episode, and I hope somebody, I really hope somebody got something from this. Oh, they are. So they get it from you every single day. Us, you, and your team. So. You guys are fabulous. Thank you for having me. No, thank you for having us here in your in your home. <laughs> Amen. <laughs>